My name is Laurie Ann Sylvester. I work with uh, Mi'kmaq and Amadnawe, MK, and I am the director for the First Nations School Success Program. And part of our program, it kind of, it's not really part of the program, but we made it part of the program, and it's, uh, it's called the Red Road Project. And the Red Road Project started in 2012. It started because our, our chiefs in Nova Scotia wanted to put on a program or have a program for the youth. So the program would be like a substance-free program for, for students or for youth where culture is incorporated into the activities that they do. What makes the program great is that it, um, it involves all of our communities. We have 12 out of the 13 of our First Nation or Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia that are part of MK and with the Red Road Project we have 12 of those communities who have a representative for, for the Red Road Project. So our Red Road Project coordinator, Jordy Marshall, he's from uh, Unamagi or Cape Breton and then we have one from the mainland of Nova Scotia, it was Tammy Bernard and the two coordinators will seek out with the help of our Mi'kmaq communities, a leader in each community who will lead the youth activities. So they would be the Red Road Project coordinator in each in their community, so they would be the lead person. But we have those facilitators, the two that I just mentioned. And what they would do is they would work together. They, they work a lot on their own, but they work a lot together in coming up with activities that are uh, cultural-based, that are you know, that incorporate any activities that, that are not associated with substance or alcohol. And it's more of keeping youth, like the cultural path or, or on the, uh, well, the red road. The red meaning, you know, referring to culture, First Nations culture. And maybe two or three times a year, the youth would come together. So they work individually in their communities to put on or to, to create projects for the youth gives the, the youth something to do. Kids can have too much time on their hands and I, I believe this project helps them build some ideas and come up with creative ways to keep youth busy and to tie in cultural, that cultural component. More so to um, see who they are, like to, to, identi like to see, to uh, express their identity as uh, First Nation or Mi'kmaq. You know, the youth have are natural leaders in something, you know. I think people are natural leaders in something, um, in general. But, you know, youth, you know, as an educator, if you see something in youth that need, they need to develop, they need, the, they need to, you need to nurture that and, and, uh, and allow for that area to grow so that they do become, you know, they're our future and they're going to be our leaders. So we want them to, you know, this project helps develop that leadership. And um, I think that it's a good investment. Um, the project is a good investment in our, in our youth because it, um, it highlights those, those, that leadership in, in the youth. And uh, it's a unique program. And it's not just a, just a substance free program. It's a, it's a program where culture is built into the program, so it makes it even more unique. And I don't know if there's any other project out there that's similar to that. But, um, and I, even though it's been going on for six years, I think there's still room to grow. It's, it's one of those programs that, excuse me, you build as you go. And, uh, you know, we've been doing it for six years. Um, and, you know, I I, meant, I forgot to mention other activities that they do. They uh, they go eel spearing, and that's uh, that's part of our uh, of our culture is uh, you know fishing and and uh, so they they uh, we hired some knowledge holders and traditional community leaders who facilitated that whole um, that whole event of eel spearing. And the students, a lot of them haven't done that before. And this is something that our ancestors have always done. So 
It's, um, we're bringing back activities that they wouldn't normally have a chance to do. And they, uh, I'm trying to think of other activities that they, that they've done. Um, they do a lot of crafts, you know, doing baskets and drum making, and they had those experiences when we went to the camp, the, le the leadership camp, student uh, youth. Could you talk more about, like, some of the ways that language and culture are incorporated? Sure. Well? Yeah. Um, well, when we first started the, um, the project, and, and you have to understand this project is new, it didn't come from anywhere, it was something that was just talked about around the table, even the Red Road Project, the name has been thought of like through a discussion around the table with a few educators, community members, and with the youth, the very first project that we had, or first activity that we had, was a leadership camp. So we had, we had all of the youth representatives from each community come together in like the western part of the province in Bear River and Frank Muse has a he's a community member in Bear River and he has a, a camp called Stone Bear Tracks and Trails so we found out about that that camp and we thought okay let's try let's let's try that out and and see how if that would be the great the good place to kind of nurture these youth to develop into to kind of enhance their leadership skills that they have already so we brought them to this camp for five days, and at that camp we did talking circles every day. We used traditional medicines to smudge, and teaching the students uh, or the youth to smudge. It was it was more of a time for them to kind of look at themselves, and how they're going to lead the youth in their community. So. We had sweat lodge ceremonies during this camp. We had medicine walks during the camp. So they learned through Frank, who's the, who's the camp owner. He would take them on a, on a walk through the trail and he would identify medicines that are native to our province, Nova Scotia. So we did that. We have an elder, his name is uh, Lawrence Wells and he's from Member Two First Nation. And he worked with all of our youth since 2012. So we've been doing this for six years. And he was there and he'd put on the sweat lodge ceremonies. He would be around the sacred fire while the students, you know, did storytelling. And we did some crafts. We did drumming and and uh, just a lot of different activities that, uh, that the youth wouldn't really be part of if they were just in their own communities. And it kind of developed a sense of community with with our youth like um they they learn and they work together collaboratively which are, is well known for our you know our our youth and our people we work well you know when when we're in groups so we did that first year we did uh we did some videos we did they made songs about the red road project we have a video on sweat lodge ceremonies lots of different uh we'd have they they would gather each year at our symposium that we have in our organization and they had like a leadership symposium for the youth for Red Road so we had some leadership activities that they would do they also would learn about the sacred teachings the seven sacred teachings and we would weave that into all of their activities that they would do even like through the leadership camp we would talk about different sacred teachings and uh what they mean and really stress like put emphasis on on those traditional uh, teachings so that um, they live by them and you know we we didn't like say for instance humility we wouldn't say okay we're going to learn about humility now but we wouldn't we would embed it into our activities and teach them about it it helps them become better people when they live by those those teachings so what see, what shows you that the program is working well, it's been for six years now, so that'll that'll tell you that it is working. And um, you know, we had some rough spots. You know, like we had, we couldn't really find or identify someone to facilitate it. But I think we have. Um, well, I don't think we. Know, I know we have a good leader now, or a facilitator, two of them, and uh, and the the interest, the the uh, the youth, they want to be part of this Red Road project. I'm not sure how, like we don't gather any data or anything like that, but 
um, I think that the communities are still interested shows that it's working and you know that uh, people know what the Red Road project is now. Have you seen a change in the kids over time? Oh yes, yeah. You see um, that you know when you go into communities they're learning about who they are as Mi'kmaq and uh, they're more involved in cultural activities that are in other communities and they're going to you know we get them to promote the project at gatherings so they're there and they promote it and then when you see them they're promoting it with pride you know so uh, they you know we have them set up a booth and they have promotional items with the Red Road project and they they uh, share with other youth in the community because not not everyone knows about the Red Road project so you see them and they're talking about the Red Road and what what fun it is and there's a few of the uh, youth who've been at the camp and they said that was the best time they ever had was at that camp and another reason why I think it works is because a lot of friendships have been made like with communities because in Nova Scotia we have 13 Mi'kmaq communities but not all the time those youth get to see each other so you have people way down in in Yarmouth which is on the west end of the province and then you have people in Member two, which is on the eastern part of the 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 uh, province, and sometimes those students don't or those youth don't have that opportunity to be together and to share activities or share parts of their culture or just just share anything you know like just to know one another uh, or be friends and that the Red Road project has given those stu- those those youth that opportunity to connect you know it's different when you're older and you're a you're a teacher or an, an educator. We're at, you know, we're at a conference in Fredericton, and I see people all the time from, you know, from Newfoundland, in different parts of Nova Scotia, different parts of New, New Brunswick, and PEI. And we have those opportunities, but not a lot of times our youth do. So this is one of the projects that allow that. I don't know if it's a story of success, but... Um, one of our uh, youth leaders uh, in the very beginning, he, he started, his name is Devin Paul, and um, he started with us, and we had, uh, he was part of making a song for the Red Road Project, and he, he's a rapper, and so he's, um, he's, he's done part of the Red Road song, and uh, so now he's touring from here to Ontario. So it's almost like this, this project kind of um, opened up that opportunity for him. And uh, so, you know, I see him now and I, I said, wow, six years ago you started doing this rapping. And, and he probably did it before that. But um, I, I think that uh, through the Red Road, he, he was able to get a few opportunities that he wouldn't normally get. And uh, so we had um, we had him um, songwriting, and and uh, so so that opened up uh, some doors for him, and I, that was a a big success story. And he had had challenges in the in the uh, in the early parts of his life with drugs and alcohol. Um, his father was killed um, as a result of um, a drunk driver. So he. Um, you know, he had some challenges to overcome, and, and it was through music in the Red Road Project that he uh, he ended up, you know, overcoming or getting past that in his life to do well. This is kind of a big question, but what to you is Indigenous education? Yeah, that is a big question. <laughs> There's a lot of talk now about Indigenous education, and I think think more people are getting what it is but I think it's really an understanding of what it is it's more than just the surface of what indigenous education there's a lot of stuff involved and I think a big part of that is is tapping into our elders and um, our knowledge holders and having them teaching the ways of our ancestors and bringing that all back because I think a lot of our with the, the technology and with TV and all of that so there's so much more to do rather than do the old the tr- traditional ways and uh, 
we're losing that a lot. And people are now talking about Indigenous education, I believe, because people are afraid now. They're seeing its reality that if we don't bring that back, we're going to lose it. And then who are we? The elders having them involved with education, um, having our knowledge holders, valuing all of those people and what they know, and bringing all of that back and keeping at it. Don't just, you know, it's got to be consistent. And, but yes, I think uh, and there's a lot of different def definitions of Indigenous education and what that means. And there's a lot, it's a big term, and there's a lot that falls under that umbrella of Indigenous education. You know, there's a lot of land-based learning. Land-based learning is a lot of that, you know, learning about our medicines, learning about the land, learning about the outdoors. As educators, we've locked ourselves inside these four walls and these institutions and not allowed for our students to go outside and learn from what's out there, what Mother Earth has to offer. We have so much out there that we could learn from, but unless we go out there and use that, the outdoors, to learn, we'll never learn about it. You can t you could learn, you could read as much as you want about the outdoors, but unless you go out there and actually experience the outdoors, you're not going to know exactly what that is. It's just like somebody telling you what medicines, different medicines, even sweetgrass. People could tell you what sweetgrass looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like. But unless you actually take that piece of sweetgrass and hold it, burn it, and smell it, and see it, then you'll know, you don't really know what it is until you do that. It's really hands-on. We're doing a lot of that now in Nova Scotia. We have a lot of our elders and our knowledge keepers who teach others about our medicines that are in our area and what they're used for. And that knowledge is important because if we don't teach people, it's going to die off. But, you know, one of our educators from Escazoni, I went into uh, her office one day and all the people that were working in the office were sitting around the table and they were making moccasins. And uh, I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. It was like a staff development day and, uh, or a staff wellness day. And she says, look, we're, we're learning to be elders. So I think that we have to, I'm going to be an elder someday. I need to know, I have to learn from knowledge keepers and elders if I want to learn that, to pass that on to people, be, you know, coming up behind me. If I don't, then I'm part of where, you know, where it dies, and, and we don't want that. We need to keep it alive, and we need to, we need to uh, consistently be at it, or else we're going to lose it all. What would be your vision for Indigenous education in the next 10 years? I think what's important is if we're going to, because a lot of this is going to be through our schools, we need our teachers to get that. They need to get it, and they need to understand that this is what is needed. We need to we need to bring in our knowledge keepers and elders. I know I've said that before, and we need to we need them to help us in our schools. We need to value their knowledge, and we can't be concerned about whether they have a bachelor of arts or education degrees because there are knowledge keepers you know I think too much we're looking at um, you know that though everyone has to have a degree but um, just for instance language you know we have a lot of people who have language and they could they could be teachers of the language but they don't have a degree so they can't teach it which we're losing out because there's a lot of people who are experts in our Mi'kmaq language but we're not utilizing them, you know, because they're not educators. They are educators. We keep using the same people, too. And we have a, you know, if we just stop looking at the education part of it, we'd have a lot more resources to look at. We need a lot of uh, human resources. We need a lot of people. Like we had um, a session just during this conference. It was just held right across... Uh, the hallway here with Terry Denny and his son. They're from, um, well, he's from Escazoni, but he lives in Budlodek. And, and um, 
and they do a lot of land-based learning and he's not a teacher you know through university but he is a teacher he's a traditional knowledge holder and there he is now just being discovered he's he's um Terry has been you know doing this stuff he lives that and um and it's just recently that he's been going to conferences and showing people because now land based education and you know that's uh that's common now people know un understand or they know that that term you know, it's only been recently that he's been doing or getting out there. So we need a lot of people like him. And that's a perfect example of somebody who's not, you know, doesn't have formal education and, and a Bachelor of Arts, but he sure can teach people how to, to uh, you know, build or, or make something, you know. He's, he's taught his son, and his son, what he, I, I believe what he's doing with his son is he's, He's shaping him, and he's he's um, building that capacity, and he's try he's going to he's teaching him what he knows, so that when he's older, then he can, you know, he can teach others. And Terry can't do it all on his own, so that's a good example of uh, how we could use human resources, and I I think that's a, that's a key component, and um, curriculum too. You know, curriculum, you know, if we're just going to follow the provincial curriculum as it is, then we're just another school like everyone else, you know. But if we're, we have that, like as First Nation schools, we have that flexibility. You know, our, our communities are um, have control of their own education. So we have that, we have that, um, the green light to do what we want to do. And so that's... A lot of the province doesn't have that. A lot of provinces don't.